Hello and a very good afternoon, uh, a very good morning, depending on from where you're joining in. Thank you so much for joining in on today's webinar. My name is Abhilash and I am from the AD Solutions team here at Manage Engine and I will be your presenter for today. Now, before we go ahead and jump in, I would like to thank all of you for joining in. Thank you so much for taking out the time out of your busy schedule. And I un understand that these are unfortunate times. These are troubled times because of the pandemic and everything. And I hope all of you are indoors and safe and healthy. Now, before we go ahead and jump into today's webinar and see what's in store for us, I would like to run a quick audio and video check because I want to make sure that everybody out here today is able to hear me well and is able to see the screen well. So I'll quickly start off with an audio check. So if you can hear my voice, if my voice is well and audible without any distortion, can you use the Q&A tab or the chat box in front of you and give me a confirmation, please? Just say yes, just say okay, so I can proceed. Thank you, William. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Ryan, Brian, for your response. Thank you, David. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Gary. Perfect. Looks like everything is good to go. Thank you so much for your confirmations. Uh, I hope the video is clear as well. I hope you can see the title and my email ID as well. So if you can just give me one more confirmation for the video, it should be good to go. Perfect, Kim. Thank you, Song. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for your responses, guys. Yes. Uh, before we get started, I would like to tell you that the entire session that's happening today, that's happening now, is going to be recorded and the recording would be sent to you on your email post the webinar. All right. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A tab. Keep your questions coming and I'd be more than happy to answer them during the course of the webinar. And even if I miss answering your questions, please do not worry. The last 10 to 15 minutes will be a dedicated Q&A session. So I will be answering your questions as well, all right? And if you have any questions later during the day, post the webinar session, feel free to drop an email to me at rb at manageengine.com, abi at manageengine.com anytime, and I'd be more than happy to help you out any way I can, all right? So the topic for today, the focus of today's webinar will be on a particular strain of ransomware called SNCC or ECAMS, right? So why did I choose to speak about this ransomware today? Why SNCC? Because like we know, there are many kinds of ransomware out there. There is Ragnar ransomware, there's Maze ransomware, there's WannaCry ransomware, right? So what's going to be the topic of discussion in today's webinar and what's going to be the end goal of today's webinar, right? So today we will learn how typical ransomware attacks strike and we will go in detail about the internal working or the internal structure of snake ransomware. And last but not the least, we will employ a simple mitigation strategy to basically protect your organization and your people and your data from the snake ransomware more specifically, but also from other kinds of ransomware. Right, so let's take a look at today's agenda. So this is what we are going to talk about today. We will be talking about the ransomware attack chain where we will discuss about typical ransomwares like Maze, like Ragnar, how they strike and what happens. And then we'll take a look at the snake ransomware and why the snake ransomware is darker when compared to the others, right? And then we will delve in depth into the internal working, into the internal structure of SNCC. And last but not the least, we'll show you how you could prevent SNCC ransomware attacks and not just SNCC, but other ransomware attacks on your network, right? But before we delve into the ransomware part of things, just a little something that I wanted to update you about. We just don't focus on ransomware alone. Manage Engine Log360 is a complete security solution for your entire network. So a major part of my job here at Manage Engine is to focus on various vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, attacks on your infrastructures, like your Active Directory infrastructures, your Azure Active Directory infrastructures, the list simply goes on. And my job is to build a mitigation strategy from these attacks. 
right? So here are a few collaterals that I would love for you to see uh, because at the end of the day, attacks can happen in many ways and ransomware is not just the only focus, right? So all of these are hyperlinked and I'd be more than happy to pass on the slide deck to you post this webinar. So it would be really helpful for you if you could just click on the links and peruse through the information within it and you can learn the different ways attackers, the different techniques and tactics attackers employ to try and intrude into your network, to escalate privileges inside your network and what you could do and how we can help to protect your organization. All right, so all of these links are clickable. For example, if I click on a particular link right here, it will take you to a particular slide deck that basically showcases the different ways attackers can obtain administrative privilege on your infrastructure, right? So how an attacker basically starts off, how he intrudes inside your network, the different ways a particular attacker can obtain administrative privilege. So each collateral that we see right here has something special for you, has something important, has something valuable for you to take back. So once the webinar is done, I'll pass you on the slide deck. Do take a few seconds, go through these collaterals. I'm sure there'll be something useful in them for you. All right, so let's jump in. This is the anatomy of a ransomware attack, right? So how does a ransomware attack work? How does it all start? Where does it all start? What tools do attackers employ to perform a ransomware attack? Right? Now, let me show you a really, really simple example of a ransomware attack. Right? So I'm going to minimize this. And as you can see, I have a PowerShell session open here, right? I'm the administrator. This is my workstation machine. So I'm not a domain administrator or anything. I'm just the administrator of my own machine. And here I have a script called Lucky Strike, right? So here's the PowerShell script, just so you know. This is the script. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try and import the script, right? So I'm just gonna do import module dot slash Lucky Strike dot PS1, right? So once the script is imported, I'm pretty sure you got the idea right now. This is a script to basically create a malicious office macro, right? So here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna create a payload first, right? Now payload is something, uh, is malware in the most basic of terms that I would like to deliver to my victim user. So he or she would run the malware, install it, so I could gain access to his or her system. Right? This is in the simplest of words. So this is how it's gonna happen. Here we go. I'm just gonna select option one. And here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna head back and I'm gonna select a catalog and I'm gonna create a new payload, right? So what's a payload? A payload could be an executable, a payload could be a PowerShell script, a payload could even be a simple command. Right, so this is how it's going to work out. I'm gonna call this encryption attack. That's going to be the title of my payload. If I have an IP address that I would like to focus on, I can enter that right here or a port number if I wanted to. Description attack to encrypt files and folders of victim user, right? As simple as that. So once I hit enter, you can see that the payload type can be a command, can be a PowerShell script, or it could be an executor. So I'm just gonna add a simple malicious PowerShell script. If I minimize my window and minimize this as well, you can see that I have a PowerShell script called ransom right here. So I'm just going to copy the path of the PowerShell script, right? So that's gonna be copy. And I am going to paste the path right here. And you can see that the payload has been added, right? What's gonna happen next? Let me head back. And let me basically select the payload. I'm just gonna say select a payload and I wanna create a malicious office document, right? So let's say a Microsoft Word document. Here we go. Here I have a bunch of payloads that I had earlier created. So I'm just gonna select a payload and I'm gonna call it a shell command. It could be a PowerShell command. And as you can see, the payload has been added, right? I'm gonna head back again 
I'm going to go back and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to now generate a malicious office macro. All right. So here's what's going to happen. I'm just going to click one, generate a new file. And as you can see, I have created a malicious macro called infected this, which basically is located on my folder payloads right here. Right. So I'm just going to take this macro. I'm going to rename it to something like termination list. And what I'm going to do next is pretty straightforward. This is the classic step in any ransomware attack. And I'm pretty sure you would have guessed it already. I'm going to launch a phishing attack. Right. As you can see, I'm sending it from my official manage engine email ID to an end user. And here's what's going, here's what's going to say. It's the termination list for 2020, right? Here is a copy of the termination list in PDF for the week, right? I'm very sorry for that. You will get your two weeks payout. And what time can I call you? My name and a random designation, right? So this is a termination email that I sent out as a phishing email to an end user. Now, as an end user, I'm worried. I'm, I do not know what's happening. I do not have the technical expertise or the knowledge to understand that this could be a ransomware attack. So what do I do? I simply download the file, right? And when I run the file, here's what happens. There's nothing in the document, right? So what I try and do is I enable the content. And once I hit enable the content, I find this message on my screen. All of my files, have now been encrypted, right? And if I want my files back, I need to pay a ransom in the form of Bitcoins or cryptocurrency. So I received the key to basically unlock my files or decrypt my encrypted files, right? Here we go, your files are encrypted, pay money to retrieve what, what are encrypted, right? So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the simplest form of a ransomware attack. As an end user, I could simply use a PowerShell script. There's nothing fancy happening here. I didn't get a tool from the internet. There's nothing, there's nothing out of the world happening. Here. I could just use a built-in tool like Windows PowerShell, and I was able to create a particular Office 365 macro, a macro that is embedded with malware, right? And the rest of the game is pretty straightforward. I could send a mail to the user, the user runs the macro, and voila, his files are encrypted. This is the most simplest way or the most classic way of performing a ransomware attack, right? But what makes snake ransomware or ECANS ransomware all the more different? Now, ECANS is just snake ransomware. So if you read it in the reverse, it just means snake. And why is this so different? Why is the snake ransomware gaining notoriety in 2020 when compared to other types of ransomware? Right? As you can see from the screen, uh, celebrity companies like Honda and NN group of companies were subject to this ransomware attack where Honda had to shut down its production for more than a month because it was subject to the ransomware attack and also the power group company NN. Right? So why is this newest strain of ransomware so dangerous? Why is it a threat to you and your people and your data? Right? Now the reason I say snake is darker than typical ransomware is because of this. The first thing that snake does as soon as it intrudes into your system is that it disables remote management or WMI. So as administrators or as help desk technicians or as security analysts, we tend to depend a lot on WMI or Windows RDP, right? Remote desktop in shorter words. What snake ransomware does is it disables this basically handicapping administrators and security analysts. So as an administrator, if you find something suspicious, something malicious happening on a user system, you cannot remote into it because snake ransomware basically disables the remoting function. Right. Snake basically targets uh, systems or companies that have power plants, ICS systems in short. And Snake has a static list of processes that it aims to kill. 
This may include backup service programs. This may include security programs like Sophos File Scanner or more, right? Snake ransomware, as soon as it intrudes into your network, disables remote management and has a kill list of hard-coded processes, something that's absent in the previous strains of ransomware. Snake uses legitimate Windows features, just like we use PowerShell to create the malicious Office 365 document. Snake also uses legitimate features like firewalls or group policies to disable communication, to establish a foothold and to propagate in the network, right? And last but not the least, Snake does not target a single system, but Snake cripples every single computer in the network, right? So this is the flow of the Snake ransomware attack chain. And this is how it's different from traditional ransomware attacks. First up, Snake does not enter via phishing emails. So the, so the entire Office 365 macro creation, embedding malware in it, depending on users to click on it and then gain access to the victim user system, Snake basically depends on exposed users' credentials. Now that we're all working from home, users often access computers, often access systems from a public Wi-Fi, home internet is less secure when compared to the corporate internet. Users have, a, have an overload of devices that they use to access company sensitive data and attackers have now started to realize that. That's the reason Snake was launched in the starting months of 2020 after the pandemic, right? Although technically Snake started off in January, but the reason Snake is gaining popularity now in the last few months is because attackers have now started to realize that the security controls that we have from home is much lesser when compared to a corporate network. Right? As soon as Snake gains access, the second thing it does is it disables communications on your network. It disables Windows firewall inbound and outbound communication. And then it destroys your backups. It destroys your volume shadow copies destroys your backup services, destroys your security programs, destroys your Windows programs like VMware or any Windows kernel that you may be running, and Snake encrypts all your files and folders. Now, this is a classic ransomware trait where all files or folders will be encrypted, but the reason Snake is different is because Snake, when it encrypts file or folders, it leaves no signature. That's right. The extension of a file or folder, once it's encrypted, signifies no snake in it, right? And last but not the least, snake leaves a note only on the domain controllers after installation, after backup destruction, after encryption, it leaves a ransom note only on the domain controllers for system administrators to see, right? So this indicates that the attackers who are performing the snake ransomware attack assume that they have domain administrator privileges, right? So let's go ahead and jump in and let's analyze how Snake actually works, right? So we will be delving into the technical aspects of the Snake ransomware attack, what it does, how it propagates within the network and the whole deal. And finally, we'll take a look at how we could mitigate Snake ransomware attacks and also other kinds of ransomware, right? So the first step, is the initial infection phase. And like I said, Snake does not depend on phishing attacks, but it depends on remote desktop protocol credentials or exposed remote user credentials, right? Companies such as Honda and NL, like I said, were subject to the Snake ransomware attack. And these are the credentials. I mean, these are the details of the workstations or of the machines within the organization that were exposed and that's how attackers were able to launch this particular attack, right? So the snake perpetrator already had knowledge, had prior knowledge about the system he or she was planning to attack, right? It's not unlike other ransomware where attackers send out a phishing email in hope that they may have, that they may gain access to an organization. They may compromise an end user system and eventually gain access. Snake ransomware is a step ahead because attackers already have the information they need before even launching the attack. They know what they're doing. This is a targeted ransomware attack. 
Now, there are many ways attackers can obtain information. Uh, there is external reconnaissance where attackers can use tools built into Kali Linux to basically find out information about your domains, about the servers in domains, their IP addresses, the list simply goes on. These are just a few examples as to how you could perform reconnaissance or surveillance using tools like the DNS recon tool that you see on your screen right now. And once attackers have access or the details of the IP address or the host name of a particular machine in an organization, the next immediate thing is to launch, let's say, a password attack, right? So this is the simplest form of attack right here where attackers often target the RDP port 3389, right? Because we're all working remote and RDP is now more used than it, than, it, than it used to be before because in the organization, we're all connected via the intranet. But now since we are not in the office, we try to connect our servers using the remote desktop protocol and the remote desktop protocol works on the port 3389. This port is basic. It has to be open for one system to communicate with another remotely. Attackers have started to realize that. And since this is the pandemic, since system administrators such as yourselves and help technicians are all working from home, attackers have started to understand that and they're launching simple brute force attacks on the RDP port that you see on the screen right here. Right, or attackers may also compromise an endpoint. Right? So let me show you a really simple example right here. I have got a video right here, right? So this is how typical RDP attacks work, right? So this is a brute force attack. This attack can be run with PowerShell again, just a simple script. As an external user, I could run this brute force attack on any system within my organization, right? So this is how it's going to work. Here I have credentials. Here I have the name of the DC. And here I have a list of potential passwords that I would like to brute force within the organization. So all I got to do is run the script and within a few seconds, you can see that it brute forces a list of passwords. And here we have the plain text password right in front of us. Right. So this is how simple it is for attackers to perform a brute force attack because the RDP port 3389 is always open. Attackers know that and they are targeting that right now. So if an attacker somehow is able to enter your organization, and connect to an endpoint machine, like a kiosk machine or a guest machine, the attack is pretty straightforward then, right? The attacker could use the guest machine access to dump credentials from its local memory, right? You could use the Windows task manager to create a dump file. And a dump file basically looks like this, right? So once an attacker has the dump file, the attacker could just take the dump file home in a removable drive or a USB stick put it in his or her system and use tools like mimic ads, like you see on my screen right now to basically extract credentials from the dump file. So if your attackers are external, they could simply perform an external brute force attack on the RDP port 3389. And if your attackers somehow have access to a system, to even a guest machine in your organization, they could extract credentials from the memory because there's a good possibility that an administrator, a local administrator or a domain admin would have remoted into the guest machine for configuration or for any other purpose, right? And if an admin has ever remoted into a machine that an attacker has compromised, he or she can simply extract the credentials from the local memory, right? Like I said, Snake is a targeted ransomware attack. And this is how the attack on Honda happened because Snake already had details about the attack on the Honda company, right? Snake had details about the server name. This is the speculated server name of the Honda company. And Snake also had the IP address of the server, which again can easily be obtained by performing external reconnaissance like you see on the screen, right? right? And once Snake has the details, it basically checks if the details are valid, right? So this is how it's going to work. Once Snake attacks, once Snake finds out a particular IP address of a system or the host name of the system, and once Snake gains access, 
it basically checks if the if the organization has a server with this host name and with the IP address. And if yes, only then will Snake be executed. And if no, Snake will terminate its operation immediately. Right. So this is how sneaky Snake is because Snake already has prior information and it will execute. It will operate only if the conditions are satisfied. As you can see, if the name happens to be mdshonda.com, only then will it be a success. Otherwise, the snake operation would fail. Right now, the next step of the ransomware attack is establishing foothold and basically blocking communication in the organization. Right? So how does snake block communication? Pretty simple. Like I said, snake leverages native tools built your system. Snake leverages PowerShell. Snake leverages group policy. Snake leverages your command prompt and the commands that are used to modify your firewall settings. Right? Have you heard of the NetSH command? I'm pretty sure you would have worked with this at some point in time when you're trying to configure your firewall. And here's what Snake does. Right? If I head on to my VM right here, here are a few examples of NetSH. Right? So if an attacker has administrative access on your domain, the NetSH command can be used to basically turn off all your firewall settings. The NetSH command can be used to basically open up a port to run a particular service or find a particular service running on a particular port. The NetSH command can also be used to find details of your remote machine or set certain values on remote machines within the organization, right? So I do, do not want to complicate this further. What Snake does is it uses the NetSH command to basically block your inbound and your outbound firewall routes, right? And the thing, the important thing to notice here is that if you have to run the NetSH command, you need administrator privileges. And this is proof to the fact that Snake assumes administrator access before it even attacks your organization. Right? So the RTP credentials that were compromised earlier should have been administrator credentials because that's the only way Snake can intrude inside your organization. Right? So the perpetrators assume admin access. And here's a second evidence or second proof to the fact that Snake assumes administrator access, right? So do you know this particular folder on your domain controller, the syswall folder? So if I quickly head on to my domain controller, you can see that this is my syswall folder. And this is where Snake propagates in the organization to other systems in the network, right? So the syswall folder is basically used to propagate or to apply group policy settings to the systems, to the various systems, to the member servers, to the workstation machines in your organization. And Snake basically uses that, uses the group policy setting uh, application process within the syswall folder to propagate itself to other systems within the organization. Right? The important thing to note here is to access syswall, you'll again need administrative privileges. Right? because this is on the domain controller and end user simply cannot open up the syswall folder, which is again, proof to the fact that Snake assumes administrative privilege, right? These three files were known to be found in the syswall folders of domain controllers where Snake ransomware had, uh, had intruded, had performed an attack in short, right? Now, the next step the Snake does is killing multiple processes and destroying backups. So Snake was able to intrude using a remote desktop connection of external recon to find out your server names and their IP addresses, a remote RDP attack, or even extracting credentials from local memory if Snake has the initial access, right? The next immediate step is to disable firewall connections and establish itself in the syswall folder to basically propagate to every other system in the network. Third important process is killing multiple processes and your backup destruction, right? So, so far, I would like to point out that Snake hasn't been using any fancy tools or any external tools. Snake has been leveraging 
your native Windows tools like your group policies or your net sh commands to basically invoke changes and let itself propagate inside your network, right? So what processes does Snake kill? Snake basically kills every uh, a list of hard coded processes, right? So the first process that Snake kills is your volume shadow copies. Now your volume shadow copies typically located in your root folder, in your C drive, are snapshots of your system. I'm pretty sure you know this already. These are backups of your domain controllers, right? So the primary thing for a ransomware attack to be successful is for it to erase any backups that you may have on the domain. There should be no way for the victim to rise back up once he or she is subject to a ransomware attack, right? Snake also kills other processes like your event log. So your Microsoft event viewer basically records events with the active directory. So here we go. If I open up event viewer, this is the place where your events are logged and snake basically terminates this particular application as well, or at least snake terminates the process of auditing events or the process where logs are audited, right? It just doesn't end there because snake destroys your VMware processes Snake destroys your Windows system processes like the kernel that you see right here. And Snake also destroys any security services that you have been running in your organization, like the SOFOS file scanner service that you see right here. Right? So just click on this link and it'll take you to an ebook where you can check out various other processes Snake is hard coded to kill. Right? So that's communications cut and uh, persistence established by placing itself in the group policies and killing processes that may give the victim any chance to rise back up or fight the ransomware, right? The next step is to basically encrypt data and lock down file or folder data. So how does Snake do this? Snake basically follows the chronological order of encrypting your file or folder data. Snake starts off from your C drive, that's right, and gradually goes on encrypting each file or folder. Right? The important thing to note here is that your default Windows system file or folders, such as these, are not encrypted by Snake because the whole idea of the Snake ransomware attack is that Snake wants to maintain default access to your system. So an attacker or uh, so the victim user should be able to log on and work with Windows, but the victim user should not be able to access any company sensitive file or folders. So Snake leaves your default Windows system folders intact, but it only encrypts your company file or folder data. And please note the NMON process everywhere. This is how Snake propagates. This is the process that you need to look out for if ever you have a suspicion that you are subject by a ransomware attack, especially Snake, right? Because the NMON process is the code for everything because that's what spreads. That's how it spreads from the group policies to every other system in your organization, right? So Snake leaves out your default system file or folders because it needs Windows to function. It requires the user to boot into a system and then realize that things have been encrypted and then realize that the user cannot access his or her file or folders. Right? So how does the encryption happen? Once Snake finds a file or folder, it basically uh, uses a symmetric key encryption uh, to lock down the file or folder. And then the snake ransomware uses a public key, right? So the attacker, this is asymmetric encryption. Basically there's a public key, there's a private key. So the snake ransomware attack encrypts the file or folder with the public key. And the private key is with the attacker, Right? The attacker also lets the victim send three of three files of his choice or her choice to the attacker and the attacker will basically decrypt those file or folders just as evidence, just as proof that if, hey, you do pay the ransom, I will send you the decryption tool or I will send you the private key that will allow you to unlock your encrypted file or folder data. Right? So the file or folders are locked down with the public key, the private keys with the attacker. And once you pay the ransom, attacker sends the private key to you using which you can unlock your file or folders, right? So this is 
the basics of the snake ransomware. This is how it works. And the snake ransomware attack adds a label basically called ECANS to each file or folder once it's encrypted, right? So this is the core of snake ransomware attack. Once a file or folder is encrypted, or once a system is infected, the snake ransomware attack adds a mutex or a marker called ECANS to the file or folder. So it does not have, uh, so it ensures that it does not infect a particular system multiple times, right? The marker is an indication of snake ransomware attack and something that snake ransomware uses to understand that the system has already been infected, right? So this is how the encryption happens and this is how your files and folders are encrypted because each file or folder is, uh, has an extension of basically five random characters towards the end of it, right? So this makes snake ransomware even more difficult to detect because typical ransomware attacks like Ragnar ransomware have an extension that can be recognized, have a signature that can be recognized by security systems. Right? For example, this is how Ragnar encrypts file or folders. There's the name Ragnar right in it, right? But the snake ransomware attack does not do so. It's extremely clever because all it does is it adds a random five character string, leaving no choice for a security analyst or a security architect to detect the snake ransomware attack on the organization because these are five random characters. You cannot detect the, the attack based on the file extensions or the signature that snakes leave behind because snake does not leave behind any signature, right? So the snake, like I said, uses your default windows processes to again encrypt file or folders. So just to reiterate, Snake starts off with locking your communication using the default tool, that's your NetSH tool, and blocks communication with your firewall, right? Snake uses your group policy, again, a default Active Directory feature to propagate within the network, right? And number three, Snake uses your default file read or write processes to encrypt your file or folders. So there is no third party process invoked here. There is no suspicious or mysterious process invoked here. And, and the reason for that is because Snake depends on your native Windows tools and features, thereby avoiding detection, right? So the last step of the attack is basically extortion and blackmail. So what Snake Ransomware does is once the attack is complete, right? Uh, snake ransomware basically enables all the settings to what they were before. So if you can recollect, we first blocked the firewall in the snake ransomware attack, and then we killed a list of processes. We killed a list of security devices on the network that are used for monitoring the network. And once all of that was done, snake ransomware basically encrypts the file of folders. And once the encryption is done, Snake removes all the blocks, all the hindrances that it had set up earlier to encrypt the file of folders, right? As you can see, the nmon.exe process basically runs a command to basically reset the firewall settings to what they were before, right? Before Snake actually blocked inbound and outbound communication. Last but not the least, the classic of any ransomware attack is the ransom note with the contact address of the attacker that you have to send your Bitcoins or your cryptocurrency to, to gain back access to your data, right? The important thing to note here is that the snake ransomware attack only drops the ransom on the domain controller, not on end user system. So if snake ever infects a workstation, Snake will only encrypt the file of folders on the workstation, but Snake will never drop a ransom note on the workstation. Snake only drops ransom notes for the system administrators, basically in this folder path. And the reason Snake does that is again, it assumes administrator privilege, right? Running the NetSH command, Snake assumed administrator privilege. Propagating via group policy, you need administrative privilege. And last but not the least, dropping a ransom note only on the domain controller. These, these pointers are testament to the fact that Snake assumes admin or domain admin privilege before even it strikes an attack on the organization. 
right? So how do you detect snake ransomware and how do you mitigate snake ransomware and also other kinds of ransomware, right? So there are a lot of things you need to look into, but for starters, you can start looking into this. The first thing, the first and foremost thing that I would like for you to do to mitigate the snake ransomware attack is to monitor your user logons. Now that we're all working from home, it's imperative that we monitor our VPN logons. It's imperative that we monitor our remote desktop logons. It's also important that we set up a network policy, right? So what is a network policy? A network policy basically looks like this, right? So this is my ADUC tool, my Active Directory Users and Computers tool. If I head into properties, and if I basically head into dial in right here, these are network access settings, right? A network policy basically is a set of rules on your network that allows users to access systems that they are only authorized to access, right? So using a network policy, using a radius server or using a remote desktop gateway is imperative because this will allow you to control your the access. So this will allow you to control what your users are accessing over the network from their homes via VPN connections, right? So this is how we can help. This is how Log360 comes into the picture because Log360 is capable of monitoring logons across your environments, right? So this is Active Directory and as you can see, these are a bunch of reports that will help you monitor and analyze just your user logons, right? So as you can see, this will help you find out the logon activity on a domain controller. You can find out from which uh, server the client logged on from, what's the host name of the client, when the client logged on, the details simply go on, right? If I scroll further down, you see something called local logon logoff here, and over here, you will be able to track logons via remote desktop services, as you can see right here, right? And if you have a radius server implemented, you can capture those logons from here as well. If you have a remote desktop gateway implemented for security, you can capture those logon activities as well, right? And the beauty of Log360 right here is that it is capable of reading into logon failures, and it will also help you to understand why a logon failure occurred in the first place. So if I quickly run this, all right, so we should get a report in front of us that will help us analyze and understand why a logon failure occurred in the first place. So let me quickly show you a real quick example right here. So if I open this up and if I log in, all right, and I'm quickly going to head into the report section right here. Here we go, I head into the report section. And here I have my log on failures report right here that will help me understand log on failures that have occurred on my domain. And not just that, I can analyze the log on failure and understand why it actually happened, right? If an older process or an older, let's say, service was using a user's stale credentials. When an older service or an older application repeatedly tries a user's expired credentials, that may lead to a lockout, right? Is it a genuine lockout attempt or is it a brute force or a password attack attempt, right? Like the RDP attack that we just spoke about. So you will be able to understand, analyze, and know why an account lockout occurred in the first uh, occurred in the first place, and the reports in Log360 can help you with that. So if you have multiple domains, all you got to do is click on the drop down, select a domain, and you are good to go. Right? If I head back into configuration right here, you will be able to configure custom alerts as well. For example, the uh, most important alert right here when it comes to ransomware attack is log on failures for admin users, right? So if I head into configuration and if I click search for log on failures, here we go. All right. And if I edit the alert that you see right here, these are log on failures 
for your admin users, right? You can set thresholds, you can create custom alerts. For example, if there are more than 10 logon failures happening in two minutes for a particular account, it could be a potential brute force attack or a password attack, potentially, right? If there's a logon failure occurring outside of business hours, it could be an attack attempt. If there's a logon failure occurring from any of the users from the admin groups in my Active Directory environment, it could be a password attack attempt again. Right? So the reports right here will help you monitor all your logons, your local logons, your radius logons, your remote desktop gateway logons if you have those implemented, and we also help you with your VPN logons as well. Right. So this is another module of Log360 called Event Log Analyzer that will help you monitor deeper changes. For example, if I head into reports right here, you see a list of VPNs right here. So the list is more, this is just what you can see on your screen right now. And you will be able to monitor log on reports as you can see right here. Now that we're all working from home, monitoring VPN logons, analyzing from which source a logon has occurred on which system and why the logon has occurred or failed is absolutely important. And the VPN logon reports can help you with just that. All right. So the next thing that I would like for you to look into is anomalies across your servers. Is a new service installed? Are a bunch of processes killed on your servers, right? Are there changes to firewall rules? Is your traffic across your VPNs being monitored? Right? So this is when Log360 can help you with that as well, because if I head into Log360 reports and windows, you see something called, called system events right here that will help you find out if a new service has been installed on your Windows system. Right? If a service has been stopped, like I said, Snake kills a bunch of uh, hard-coded services. Right? So you can detect if services are abruptly stopped by whichever application or whichever process, right? And if I head down here, you find something called Windows Firewall Auditing. If any ransomware attack like Snake modifies your firewall rules, blocks inbound and outbound communication, you can detect those changes from right here, right? You can also detect changes across your network policy. Like I said, it's important that you have a network policy to ensure that only authorized users access your servers internal to your organization. But if an, un an unauthorized user is granted access, you can detect changes such as that from here, right? And like I said, now that we're all working from home and now that we're all using VPNs, it's important that we monitor traffic and you can do that with the firewall allowed traffic report right here. So if you use the Cisco VPN, for example, you can find out firewall allowed traffic. You can find out the source, meaning from which source uh, a particular logon occurred, a particular logon failure occurred. What is the IP address? And if the IP address is fishy, you can immediately configure an alert where an admin or a help desk or an authorized user will be alerted immediately via email and via SMS. Right? So Block360 can help you detect new service installations, firewall changes, malicious processes or unknown processes across your member servers. Right? Lock360 can also help you detect changes across your files and folders. Now this is something really important. This is something you have to look into. So if I head into Lock360 and the AD Audit Plus component of Lock360, you've got something called File Audit right here that will basically help you detect changes across your files and folders. Right? So if a bunch of folders are deleted, if a bunch of files are modified, or if they are renamed across any workstation in your organization, the tool will detect it and the tool will immediately throw an alert. Right? So an alert looks something like this. Like I said, here we go. If I type in file and here are a bunch of alerts on your screen right now. And the alerts are extremely filterable. Like I said, you can set customized alerts. You can alert an admin via email, via SMS, and you can also execute a mitigation script. Now a mitigation script is something that you can set up just in case you are not available in your organization, right? So if an end user workstation has been infected with a ransomware attack, the tool will immediately detect it 
and the tool can basically turn off the end user's workstation because you have a custom script configured, right? So the tool can turn off the end user's workstation, terminate the user's session, the list simply goes on. So it's not just detection, it's not just monitoring security changes, but it's also mitigation action just in case you are away from your system. Right? It's also important that you monitor deletions of shadow copies from your root folder, from your C folder, across your domain controllers, and the tool can help you do that as well. Right? It's also important that you monitor your group policy changes. Now, do you recollect this point where, where I said the group policy, where the ransomware spreads from the syswall folder? Right? So that's when the tool can help you because the tool is capable of monitoring your code or your configuration files and folders in your environment, right? So if I headed to configured servers right here, you have something called file integrity. And this is where you can monitor your core system file or folders, right? So if it is a root file or folder, if it is the syswall folder, like I said, that is, that is responsible for maintaining group policies or security policies in your organization, all of those changes, any modifications, any creations will be detected by these reports. And of course, you can configure custom alerts as well, right? And not just that, uh, Lock360 is capable of monitoring your group policy changes. For example, if an unauthorized random user is granted remote privilege on a domain controller via group policy, you can monitor those changes, right? If an attacker basically uses the software installation feature of group policies to deploy malware or ransomware to end user systems in the organization, you can detect those changes as well. And this is how it does, right? If I head into reports, we've got something called group policy reports right here, where you will be able to monitor group policy settings. So if settings are modified, if they are changed, if a user is added, if a user is removed from a particular setting, if a user is given a privilege via group policies, all of those changes will be detected right here and you can throw an immediate alert to the authorized users. Right. And last but not the least, it's important that you proactively track certain privileged activities on your domain. For example, if a password is reset or changed for an administrator account, why did that happen? If a user is added to an administrator group, like the domain admins group or the enterprise admins group, why did that happen? If a permission on an account is explicitly given, for example, this is my Active Directory Users and Computers tool, this is an account. If an end user, any user in the organization is explicitly granted a permission on this account, full control or modify permissions, changes such as that must be brought to notice, must be detected. And last but not the least, if your users are running malicious scripts on workstations, because most ransomware attacks spread via scripts, via PowerShell scripts, like the initial script that we just created to create a malicious Office 365 document, the script that we just executed. So if any malicious scripts are run across workstations, you should be able to detect that and the tool can do that for you as well. So if I head into server audit, We've got something called PowerShell auditing right here that will help you audit malicious PowerShell scripts when your end users run them, right? So if it's a script to create a malicious Office 365 macro, if it is a script to modify firewall settings, if it is a script to give a user a backdoor access to an admin group with an active directory, changes such as that can be brought to notice because you can immediately detect if an end user is running a script that he or she is not supposed to run, right? So Log360 is a single console for you to detect any kind of ransomware attack attempt and not just that, any security change or suspicious change or sensitive change that happens on your team, right? So the major components of Log360 are many, but the two important components that we discussed today are AD Audit Plus, this is a component of Log360 so both the solutions, AD Audit Plus and Event Log Analyzer come under Log360, where AD Audit Plus can help you change monitor your infrastructure, your data storage devices, like your files or folders, your NetApp, your EMC, et cetera, for changes, right? So if there is a security change, if there is a permission change, if there is a modification, 
the tool will detect those changes for you real time and throw you an alert, right? And event log analyzer right here is for, for tracking deeper security changes, like mostly configuration changes, right? Like your firewall changes, your registry changes, a malicious service installed, right? And if you've got a bunch of network devices in your organization, and if you wish to analyze their logs and find out anomalies, Event Log Analyzer can help you with that as well. Again, AD Audit Plus and Event Log Analyzer are sub-modules of Log360. All right, so yes, that is about it for today. So what we basically did was we started off with a simple ransomware attack attempt, and then we started comparing typical ransomware attack with snake ransomware. We learned how it could intrude. We learned how it propagates within the network. And finally, we adopted a bunch of mitigation strategies, right? This is the only way out because snake ransomware modifies various settings on your systems. And it's important that you monitor these components of your IT infrastructure and detect any suspicious or sensitive changes when they happen in real time, right? Because a simple mistake, a simple permission that may have gone unnoticed could lead to a ransomware attack and Log360 can help you with that. All right, now before I end this webinar, I would like to thank you all for joining in. Now I understand that this may have been a tad bit technical, but it was important for us to understand how Snake works because Snake has just started and is spreading rapidly to attack multiple organizations. Right? And all the mitigation measures that we just saw, the group policy detection, the service detection, uh, services installed or stopped, or any PowerShell script when they are run by users, file or folder changes, log on monitoring, any mitigation action that we saw is just not, uh, it's only not applicable to snake ransomware, but it can be applied to any typical ransomware attack in your environment. Because ransomware attacks typically follow a same chain. They intrude, they encrypt, and then they extort. Right? and Log360 can help you with those changes. Now, before I end today's webinar session, I would like to thank you all for joining in. Thank you so much for taking out the time.